<laughs> and we are live. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here with me. Matt, Thank it's you, good buddy. to hear from you. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Way too long, uh, buddy. You know, way too long. Um, you know, we go way back. We have a little bit of history with uh, how things went down back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to discussing a whole bunch of things today. And we'll go on here as long as you like, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Michael, you got anything to say? Uh, actually, we, we just just a few seconds ago, I was going, there's a lot to talk about here. But for, actually, I'm really curious. How do you how do you guys know each other? Where did you guys where did you guys meet? So, um, you know, like before I even get going, I'm just going to say this because um, I wanted to be completely in the loop with this because I, I was never a podcast guy until now that this all came up. Yeah. And um, Mark and I, we go way back. And, and I, at least my recollection is through Sean Pearson. That's mm -hmm. it's an incredible how these circles come together. Um, so we go back well over 20 years, Mark and I. Uh, I've always had great respect for Marco. Unfortunately, it's far and few between that we crossed paths, but I always enjoy having conversation with him. And it was through this opportunity, so thank you, uh, to do the podcast that I made a point of getting completely up to speed. So I've watched them all, and I've always had great respect for Marco. But with everything that I've seen now, if you were up here, you're – you're so no, beyond, dude, but it, stop, it has man, been it, this is true this is truth and it's important to say this because um you you share you have been sh continually sharing your wisdom you have given a, a true raw authentic perspective on so many things uh i've certainly learned a lot and i i also feel um really good because there's tremendous affirmation because what i what i also realize is that our thinking is very much aligned. Like I, be, I believe very much in, in many of the things that you've talked about. And Michael, you do a, you do a solid job, man. Like it's, ah. <laughs> it's, an, it's an honor. It's an honor to be here. So let me just put it that way. Cause that I wanted to make sure that that got put in there. Um, so our background. So it, um, it, I was training it, and I know we're going to be like leaping around all over the place here. Um, I went to school okay. uh, at Brock. And uh, at the time, I was still involved in MMA, and, and my goal was to truly, really round out my game. So I wanted to train um, takedowns. So I started uh, training in that wrestling room, and uh, and it's incredible because I'm born and raised in Niagara Region. So for better or for worse, I was going to train uh, at Brock. That also happens to be the powerhouse, and I mean, you could arguably mm -hmm. say that Brock would be uh, the Canadian kind of uh, equivalent to, to Iowa. Just look mm -hmm. at how many championships, uh, provincial championships, national championships, how many Olympians are there. And uh, through meeting Sean, yeah. I find out that yeah, he's 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 interested in getting involved in uh, in uh, MMA. And then all of a sudden, the circles start coming together. I, I met uh, Richie Nanku Monkey, met Marco. Uh, uh, Justin Brockman, um, Antonio Carvalho, um, the crew. The, yeah, it's just it, it, <laughs> they, those guys were ruthless too. Like just a bunch of <laughs> amazing guys, uh, incredible technique, but they were ruthless. And the pranks and the stuff that went on was absolutely—it <laughs> it was crazy, man. There's not enough time in the day to talk about the stories, but um, it was it was through Pearson that there was the link to 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 all those guys, and I, I'm very very thankful that. Uh, the path afforded that opportunity for for us to be able to meet, and um, yeah, man. So you met you met Sean Pearson in, right. the, Pearson, in the Brock wrestling room. Pearson's a boss. Sorry, yeah. Michael. Pearson's uh, a boss, man. Uh, man, that guy's amazing. Super talented athlete. Uh, it was like, it was fun getting beat up by him, and I enjoyed the training sessions very much. And I was I was so proud of him when he made it to the UFC. I was like, like oozing pride because that guy, I knew he had the talent. I knew he had the ability and to see him at the biggest stage. And it was great, yeah. man. He's, and, he's a, he's a cool. Dude. And, and the crazy thing, cause I think it's, it's important to, to put this out as well as, you know, like, and this is, this is in addition to Sean and in, in his ability, um, the people that really knew him, especially back then Pearson was like Conor McGregor <laughs> before Conor McGregor was even in existence. If you knew Pearson's personality, yeah. Yeah. if that yeah, personality yeah, would, would, would have come out and say the <laughs> UFC, maybe he would have gone a complete different oh, way yeah. because he had incredible, like he, as a fighter then, and I'm sure still now, um, he had incredible talent, but his charisma, his energy, he was an entertainer. Anybody with the name, the pimp daddy. Oh. <laughs> and, 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 which was hurt him, which, which hurt him, unfortunately, for, for some other career. Yeah, in the future, later on, it kind yeah. of came back to bite him, but 
Uh, I mean, I actually, in the uh, moment at the time with those fights and his hat and his shirts and his whole attitude was like, yeah, very, very similar to Connor's. It was, it was, it was fun, man. We had what, fun. Did he, he actually walked out like that to his fights? He actually, oh, he, oh. <laughs> the, 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 this, and I remember yeah. being at the store when he was Fuzzy trying to hat, what to just, wear and Wooly was there too. And he's like, what are we going to do? Like, like, like every other menacing guy and, and get a two. He's like, no, 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 we're not doing that. So then <laughs> Pearson pulls out this, this, this hat. I almost thought that uh, Khabib had that same, but that that's like a warrior hat. But yeah. it was like some frilly crazy hat. And, and he put on, it was like a cape. Like we were getting in trouble there in, in Montreal. And then there was a whole bunch of these like, uh, like velour top hats. And then we all got those top hats, but then Pearson's was just like a, a next level. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. I want to yeah, be that guy. I'll ask the way. Well, how did that come back to bite him? That sounds, that sounds, that sounds awesome. Like I'm surprised. I didn't, no. I didn't know the side of him. Like, from like, oh, it was a, a show, man. Yeah. You could see loved it. The promoters loved it. The, he he put on the show. Okay. Uh, so the, it would have been right around the time that he was looking to um, kind of have that that change in career because he. So here's another thing. He's a brilliant guy. Like yeah. people may think, oh, you know, he's a tough guy. This other, he was like a straight A student. This is the guy that when he would uh, present uh, for his class at Brock, he showed up in a suit. Um, he played piano. Like this guy, he was unbelievable. Very uh, diverse, but oh, he's, um, he's a smart guy. In, incredibly intelligent guy. Um, he had aspirations of getting into police. And okay. my understanding was that uh, he was well on his way um, with uh, uh, Toronto Police Service. And yeah. uh, I think he was lined up to, 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 uh, to partake in his recruit training at the police college. I believe he got in. I believe he got in. He was going to go, but then an opportunity came up. For the UFC. And he had oh. to, you know, like, okay. And he's like, well... I guess he can always get into the police department later. So he's like, I'm going to go for it. And he, he went all in with the UFC, which but, was, man, it was, it was good. It was good. But that, I, my understanding, again, in mm -hmm. based on what information is available, yeah? Um, yeah, yeah. Was that the, the especially the nickname created some very serious issues. Uh, and I think that ultimately led to the policing career being being derailed. That's uh, my understanding. Okay, okay, so you okay. to, and you know what? I think that was an obstacle. I'm not sure if it got comp like a hundred percent derailed. I don't know. I guess we'd have to talk to Pierce, bring him on he here. Needs to come on here. Hopefully he's been brought up many times. I don't know. He's been brought up so <laughs> many episodes, man. I think you maybe need to have him too. I, I, yeah. I'm just saying, well, like, enough I, about Pimp Daddy, man. Let's talk about you, man. <laughs> so, t tell us a, a little bit about your MMA career. Now, I know that you didn't have a lot of fights, right? But the fights that you did have, <laughs> man, they couldn't ease you in to a couple of like amateurs or something. You know what I'm saying? They couldn't like give you a couple of fair fights. No, man, they threw you right at the big dogs right off the bat. So was that like a decision that the Lions then made? And we'll talk about that as well. You being part of the Lions then, Ken mm -hmm. Shamrock and the crew. Uh, we'll I talk think about that, but how did you end up having to fight these top guys right off the bat? That's how it was at the time. Like watching the previous episodes, and you were talking about you know the challenges of trying to get uh, trying to get fights and so on. Um, it was mm -hmm. so, it was so, so grassroots then. And, and again, we're just kind of jumping around all over the place, but be, being, uh, w with the team in California, um, the, the, the guy, the guys were, were getting opportunities to compete all over and the opportunity was presented to, uh, to compete in Australia. And, uh, there, there was like just some, something like crazy going on there because they were, they were presenting like it was uh the ufc or they, they were using that uh, marketing line the australia ufc and i think there was major uh litigation issues or attempts mm -hmm. to 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 have litigation between uh at the time semaphore entertainment group and um and the promotion for um the australia ufc because that's how it was promoted at the time and i think it, it had changed names and so on um but the opportunity uh, was presented to, to partake. And initially I was listed to be an alternate. And then it just so happened that I was bumped up onto uh, the main card, but it was simply um, uh, Bob Shamrock, who was our, who was our manager, basically, you know, set, set the stage. This is the opportunity that you have. And of course, like Ken being the, the lead and then Frank being a um, kind of our head trainer. Um, 
I just followed their lead and that was what was presented at the time. And I was, uh, yeah, I was like super excited to have the opportunity. All right. I'm dropping names right from the get go. Then dude, your first fight is Elvis Sinisic. Yes. King of Rock and Rumble. Yeah. So at that point in time, like as far as I know him, he was like, uh, like the pioneer for Australian MMA. He was kind of a, like kind of a big deal in the early UFCs. Um, but you fought him and he was zero on one. If I understand correctly or something like that. Uh, it was that- early. Either, either he had no. Um, I, I'm quite certain that was his first professional fight. Maybe it might not have been his first fight ever. Maybe, maybe it's possible he had uh, an amateur fight before then. But he was still very, very new into the sport, just like me. And uh-huh. I think he was linked up with John Will. And I think John Will's part of the Dirty Dozen. Mm-hmm. So, like the lineage really, really, really goes far back with uh, with all this, right? Okay. But yeah. So. Um, I guess then, like. So at the time, it's like he's not that guy. That guy that like I, I guess I see in terms of like the uh, the history of like the one of the UFC came up. He was just he was just another guy like ju- like just like you guys were just making your professional debuts respectively. To my understanding, he, he was also making his debut as well. Okay. Yeah, that's right. okay. Yeah, that's okay. And then from there, I guess uh, from there uh, you also fought Akihiro Gono, which is <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> all, 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 contextually speaking, no easy fights, man. No easy you know. fights. No, nothing. Not then. Like, not what, then. What was the context of him? Like when when you walk off of that fight, like was he kind of like a veteran, or how does how did you see it at that time? That was like like a, like a incredible mismatching in terms of experience. That was my that would have been my second pro match. That was like his thirty third or thirty fourth pro match. We were pretty close on <laughs> weight, which and this is interesting too because back then the variances in weight classes or just variances between oh, two two Damn. weights was just outrageous. Like Damn. the the third the third one was even worse, but. Um, the the person who really got me involved in all this is, is, is a fellow named Charlie Anzalone. And some people may or may not recognize the name, but I guarantee you, if you follow MMA and you followed MMA for many, many years, he's probably one of the most identifiable people because mm-hmm. um, you would see him as uh, one of the uh, the officials like in the, in the burgundy suit in, uh, in Nevada. But he... Um, oh, I think he, I know you're talking about. So, Short guy. Yeah. And he, yeah, you got okay, it. And so you. he, he's the one that got Kevin Rozier into UFC one. So he was around the UFC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Local, very, very well connected guy. He was involved with UFC for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He was. Time. And that, and he actually was the link that even brought me on the MMA path to begin with. Uh, and, and ultimately was like a, a major uh, facilitator in getting to the, the Lions then. But basically like I've always, I've always had that contact with Charlie and uh, Charlie had a great connection in Japan and uh, he was able to get me the, the, the match in Shudo, which was, which was pretty wild. And that was uh, the one, one card after Joel Gerson had the upset victory over Sato. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. I believe Carlos Newton also fought on that card and Omar Silvosa also fought on that card. So it was yeah. a really good showing yeah. for Sam Ray club. They did well. No kidding. Wow. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Of- yeah, but the, that was on the same <laughs> card fight when you fought. The, so those guys fought the card previous, I believe. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, because man, the Samurai Club back then was, you know, they were they were a powerhouse. It was it, them and, and the you know, um, oh, what was uh, Grappling Arts Academy? Yeah, Grappling, Grappling Arts Academy. Academy. Yeah. yeah, those two, as as I remember mm-hmm. it, like in in the tournament scene yeah. way back then, that that was always a, like we, a strong rivalry. Yeah. We we came we were like we came shortly after like very shortly after it was the Franco Bering team, mm. and then we started to push back, uh, and then Jocelyn's had a good team as well. Yeah. So I think it was like us four, and then Omar had a nice crew going as well down on uh, down on Queen Street. So yeah, it just started to grow from there more and more and more. But those are I think the original four crews that were doing very well back then. And, and the crazy thing is that you've got uh, you've got pockets of incredibly talented people, and the mm-hmm. six degrees of separation. We all managed to cross paths. We got to know each other. There there were some some cross training opportunities. I remember getting a chance to roll a monkey once, and that's even a funny story. But nothing close to the stuff that you had, Marco. But a, fu- a funny story. But um, yeah, man, it's just very cool that you've got like minded people that are all over the place, but that we managed to come together. And that and then um, the uh, the MMA events. In uh, in Quebec, so there's that kind of that Ontario Quebec thing, yeah, and I yeah. think that 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 uh, um, I don't know conflict. I think that was the it. biggest connection between all the fighters because yes, okay, locally we're like okay, we have our teams, we fire our flags, and we want to win. But whenever we went as a crew to yeah. 
to Montreal. Yeah. It was usually Ontario versus Montreal. So we kind of yeah. stuck together and supported one another and cheered, cheered, cheered each other on, which 100%. is great. Yeah. So they finally gave you a competitive fight with Sean Tompkins, you know, rest in peace, yes. Sean Tompkins. Uh, and uh, you did very well for yourself in that fight. So tell us a little bit about that. And then why did you decide to walk away from MMA? I mean, that was your last fight. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably the same reasons why I walked away, but I want to hear your side. Sure, sure. Um, so just before that one was Dennis Reed. That was the crazy mismatch. I weighed in at 184. He weighed in at 201 when it was supposed to be 199. He had like 50 fights or something. And that was actually one of my most favorite fights because I felt like that was a, a really cool back and forth deal. Uh, IFC and Kanawake where we're talking – Take, take yeah. your gloves off, wipe off the blood, give give the gloves to another yeah, fighter. To someone that, else. Is, that is the way it was <laughs> back then. Wow, right? that's, that's, that's then. the way it wow, was. Guys. But a little, little pocket of information there. So, Sean, um, what an incredible opportunity. Um, uh, Pete Rodley and Stefan Petri had started uh, UCC. And um, mm -hmm. I had I met Tompkins at uh, the IFC event, because I think he was there with maybe Rob Talek or something like that. Just, you know, like, yeah, nice yeah. to meet you, that kind of That's thing. Guy, Rob. Yeah. And uh, then the card comes together. It might have been Pete that reached out and said, we're, we're looking to to, to uh, have a, have a, an event, and um, this is what we're looking to do to, to link you up. And That's awesome, because you're going to take anything that you can get at the time. And I think the really cool thing with Sean was that um, he, he did a really good job of creating that, that attention, that stir, because he was, um, a very like charismatic, intense person. You like, he, like he was people a were, great motivator. Yeah. He people was a were great motivator. Him. Yeah, yeah. Drawn to him like magnets and, and such a personal person, very skilled. And that's the reason why he became arguably one of the world's best MMA coaches. Yeah. Um, so we get lined up to, to fight and, and like, as I'm thinking about it, uh, that was still a time when you could wear shoes because I wore wrestling shoes, oh, but obviously the condition was that I could not kick. I could knee, but I couldn't kick. And um, so I was training um, with, a, with, a, with a handful of guys from Brock. Um, my buddy that I, I worked with on, on campus as well, Chris Chung, he helped me a lot. Marty Calder um, made some time for me, which was amazing. The, the, all the wrestlers, they were very giving of their time, and I was thankful for that. Jeremy Sills, he, he certainly helped me out, and then his career kind of took off for BGJ MMA. Um, so it, it, it just worked out really well, and, and because my, my training for the most part was no gi, it, it was good, but I think – um, they, there was an impression that I was just going to be looking to take the fight to the ground, but, um, out my way, we have a gym, uh, Napper's boxing club. It's a very, very well-known gym, uh, here and, um, kind of like the, um, uh, the, the, the patriarch, Ray Napper senior, he coached two Olympic teams, 88 and 92. So there is an incredible, uh, lineage for boxing. So I, I really kind of started to focus on boxing and my trainer, uh, Tommy Napper senior really helped me. Uh, even previous to that fight, when, when Pearson and I fought on the IFC car, Tommy Napper Sr. W was helping us out. And that fight with Sean, uh, it's kind of more of a stand-up. Like, we were, we were just trading back and forth. It was just like a, like a rock'em, sock'em robots. Uh, some takedowns and stuff, too. But it was, it was a stand-up fight. And I think that probably caught him off guard because I didn't think he was expecting me to, to stay up and stand. Because he, uh, he was a very, very dominant kickboxer. He was a good striker, right? Um, I'm curious. I think if I remember creating correctly, the round time finish for that fight was like eight minutes, which implies that the round was not five minutes long. Ten, ten minute round, and I think it was set up for like a five minute overtime or something like that. Oh, so yeah. it's like pr this is pre Pride, which is interesting, right? And I was, say, I was very Pride esque. Yeah. Pride eventually ended up having that ten minute round, first round, second yeah. round, five minute, right? And I was thinking about it, like, was that one of the first regulated MMA events uh, in Quebec, and even where would that fall with yes. Canadian? Okay, the, it was. the first UCCs were sanctioned by the the, the sports commission, so they the were no event. longer being held in the in the native reserves. Right, uh, Kanawake. Um, yeah, I was curious as to where that would fall in the Canadian MMA kind of history. Like, wh what would have been one of the first uh, sanctions? 
uh, and pro MMA events. And that one I, was was 2000, June second of 2000. And um, mm. yeah, so it's pretty pretty wild to to be a part of that because at the time you're just happy to partake. But now in retrospect, it's like wow, it was really cool to have been a part of something like that. You know, uh, things kind of forming up like uh, the structures that are in place now. It's like they're kind of being tested out during this time period. That's actually insane. Mm -hmm. um, I so just why, why did you walk away? Okay, so um, it it was it was a it was a career thing. So. Uh, I was in my early 20s and and I was looking to get into a career in, in law enforcement, which I'm very, very thankful for, which I continue to do. And I had um, completed uh, baseline testing to to advance forward to start applying for police services. And as a result of that happening, uh, I, I made the decision. And it was like, okay, I, I want to focus on uh, like a, like a, my career that I think is, is going to, you know, sustain a livelihood and so on. And even at that time with, with, um, the, the sport of MMA really evolving and getting so much better. Um, I had, I had to make that decision. What was it that, I, what was it that I really needed to think of in terms of like sustainability? And, uh, it made sense. It was, it was a tough, tough decision because it's like, wow, now I'm actually starting to, 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 uh, develop as, as, as a, as a competitor. I've won a match. I'm now I'm, I'm slated to go into a four man tournament to fight, for the first uh, UCC middleweight title, because I think that was the, the way at the time, and it was minus 180 pounds. Um, and uh, I made that difficult decision to, to, to go a, a different way. And um, yeah, on one hand, it's like, yeah, it would have been cool to have done a bit more, but at the same time, I'm extremely thankful for the path that I took because I continue to travel on that path. Awesome, man. No, definitely, uh, it, it was hard. It's hard to walk away, but at the same time, uh, when you look back at the time and you you really understand the, the 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 dynamics of how everything was working out, you know having an MMA career it wasn't easy. Uh, they were they didn't pay almost. <laughs> you know it was terrible. The pay was terrible. So that, making a living yeah. as an MMA fighter was not the smartest thing to do back then. And a lot of good uh, and talented guys walked away early because of that. It, and their careers were cut short. Just because it just didn't make sense you, that you can you can actually go make more money with a regular job, right? So, mm -hmm. and you're not taking all the damage, but it is very hard to walk away because you're passionate about it, you you, you love it, uh, you're having fun with it. But you know, I think especially in Canada, we're so uh, we're pretty conservative in our thinking and, and very very logical in our thinking, and we're like, nah. This ain't gonna work, and you know you, you gotta make better decisions. I made the same decision. It was just didn't make sense. No money, fight card, no fight card, train, train, train. Car gets pulled out. I'm like, you know what, man, I'm done. My, and it's it. Sorry, you know, my my ahead. fight for the for the IFC. There was a different person I was supposed to fight, and it was literally at the last minute. They said, I think it was Mark Jakewith, I think was the name. And like, no, he can't fight. He's injured or something along those lines. Instead, you'll be fighting Dennis Reed. And that and that's just how it happened. Is that you, you were thankful that you still had the opportunity to uh, to actually get get into the ring or get into the cage because of so much time that you invested, so much sacrifice to prepare and be ready to go. So you'd got you'd be ready to do pretty much anything because you you truly love the sport it definitely wasn't about the money i mean i think by by the end of it to 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 show so you're just simply you're getting your your base pay regardless win or lose on my on the last one dude it was like 350 bucks or something like that it was it, right it was not about the money it was it was truly for the love of the sport and we loved what we did and that's why we yeah. did it there's a bit of a time gap we kind of skipped over. That's kind of a really big question mark from when I was like la, looking into your, like the, the career. So you want, you were wrestling at Brock, you met Sean Pearson, you linked up with all the Ontario OGs, but what, there's a bit of a time skip. What led you to get going to the lions then of all places? And like that, especially during this time period, because that's like their heyday. Like that was when they were kind of in yeah. power, so to speak. How did what? that, yeah. What happened? Wild story. But let, but let me first, let me put a clear yeah. distinction. Um, I, I was very fortunate and thankful to have the opportunity to train with Brock, but I would never have considered myself a Brock wrestler. Like the guys who were the, 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 the ones who were aspiring to do well 
uh, as a club team, because I mean, aside from at the time it was called the, the OUs, like the provincials and the CIs and the nationals, short of that, it was a uh, Niagara Olympic wrestling team. So now you're competing in those tournaments because maybe you're thinking about senior nationals and such. My, my uh, intent when I was there was just to learn takedown. So I, I, I like to train with the team, but I certainly would not say I was a Brock wrestler just as a kind of like a clarification point. Cause I don't want to devalue the incredible amount of talent yeah, no that, that was there. So I, I really want to kind of put the clarification there. So uh, you want to talk about a wild story? Here's a wild story for you. So um, I, I'm a dual citizen, Canada, and United States, oh, okay. and I was working at uh, a bar in Buffalo, and I was working security, talking to uh, a bunch of the other guys because the UFC was still very, very new at the time. Mm. And we're talking about it, this, that, the other, and then this guy comes along, as Faye would have it, it was Charlie Ann's alone, and uh, so he worked at the at the uh, uh, Buffalo or technically Cheek, Cheektowaga Airport, where my mom also happened to work. So another you know connection. Um, and but he did a whole bunch. Of, he had a bunch of side hustles. He was a DJ. He was a kickboxing promoter. He was this, that, the other. And he kind of got wind of the conversation. So he he kind of chimes in. He's like, oh, the UFC, yeah, you guys must know, you know, like uh, Kevin Rozier who fought from around here. And and here's the the, the classic question. They said, man. I would love to go to one of those live. How do you get tickets for it? Right? And, and he goes, I'll tell you what. Uh, I got a guy lined up to fight in UFC 6 in Casper, Wyoming. His name was Joel Sutton. If you can get a plane ticket, which was not a problem at all, uh, you link up with me and uh, you're, you're with the entourage. You, you, you will get a firsthand view of it. And that's how it started. I got, got the plane ticket, went to Casper, Wyoming. And I was with, um, with Charlie and, and Joel and his entourage. And uh, that was when uh, Ken was fighting uh, Dan Severn. I believe that might have been the no, the first or the second, maybe the second super fight, right? Mm -hmm. So I met. Uh, I was, it's just, I'm just awestruck because there's like all these people. You watch all the first few UFCs, and you're just more like, wow, like there's this person, there's this person, there's this person, and uh, meet Ken, super super nice guy. But uh, the real connection was Bob. Bob Shamrock and he and he there he was rest in peace lo loved him. Um, there's just just some, this is the adoptive father. Yes. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he he liked to bust chops and for whatever reason he took a liking to me and he was just busting my chops the whole time. But it was super friendly, super funny, laughing like crazy, um, and uh, present uh, for the event. Watched the event. You know, it was an honor to meet you guys. Right. Shake hands and off and off we go. And as fate would have it. The next UFC, which is UFC 7, was held in Buffalo, New York, right? Well, being in the Niagara region, it's a border community. So for sure, I'm going to be there. And um, so uh, I'm working at that 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 place. It was called The Pier. It's just long since closed. But uh, working at The Pier, and then sure enough, the UFC fighters are arriving, and some of them want to go out and, and have some drinks and stuff like that. Boom, there's Ken Shamrock in The Pier. Hey, man, what's going on? Chit-chat with him for a couple seconds because he was very personable. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, again, fight like, Oh, that's awesome. Like super excited for it. I said, Hey, where are you guys doing your, why are you, where are you guys doing your, your final training, your tapering training, this, that, the other. And he's like, we don't have any place. The UFC hasn't provided us with a place to train. I'm like, are you kidding? So I said, well, tell you what, let me, let me kind of ask some questions and, uh, let me see if, if I, if I can help. So, um, I was doing Japanese jujitsu at the time. I was training with a, with a guy named Wayne Wells. And uh, he's since gone off into stunt choreography, done real well with it. But he uh, he was who I was trained with in Japanese jiu-jitsu at the time. And uh, I said, Wayne, like, this is what's going on. Do you think, you know, we might be able to help these guys? I was like, are you kidding? Absolutely. So what we were doing is we were driving from Welland to, uh, to their uh, hotel in Buffalo. We picked them up. And then we drive them back to Welland. They would do their, their workouts and we kept it very tight, like not drawing attention to who, who's on ground. Uh, training's done, driving back to Buffalo and come back because we, we were support. We wanted to do everything we could to support. We're, we're fans, of course. And um, during the course of the training, a bunch of the guys that I trained with had a chance to train uh, with Ken and uh, Ken had taken an interest in, in a guy named Ryan Labaki. And that was one of my, one of my training partners. And, um, Basically, Bob had said, you know what, we're, we would like to, or Ken would like to invite Ryan to, uh, to try out for Lion's Den, like to go to California and try out. And he said, you know what, Matt? He goes, you should, you should try out too. So it was kind of like a, uh, a, very, a very kind gesture to, to invite me. They were interested in my buddy. My buddy, like he, he, was, he was a big, strong boy and he, and he showed the potential that they were looking for. Um, and so he, he got the invite and I was kind of like just a kind, a kind gesture, an invitation extended, yeah? 
And as, it, as fate would have it at the time, uh, Ryan was going to college and he wasn't able to try out. But I was at a point where um, I had finished high school. Um, I, I, I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. There, there, there wasn't a job I was holding down. So there wasn't anything holding me back. So I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go try out. So I was working out the best I could with the, the information that I had to prepare. And, um, and I went there and I'm like, you know what? I am like, I am not stopping. I am going to do my best. They're going to have to, to force me to quit. And, uh, and I made it. And I was like, Whoa, it was just now it's like hyper speed. Like, did that actually just, did I really just do that? Did that just happen? And, uh, and that's when things took off. And of course, I mean, with, with citizenship, it's not a problem to, 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 to live there for whatever the duration of time is going to be. Right. So I become a part of the team. And at the time, um, we had a, a place on Ken's ranch in Clements, which is like population 250. Um, and I lived with, uh, Frank Shamrock, Jerry Bolander, Pete Williams, uh, Hagar Chen, who his time kind of was a little bit short one by the time I got there and, uh, I lived, lived with the guys that we, we trained full time, uh, worked out, uh, weights in the morning. And then we have our, our, uh, training sessions like, um, striking, grappling, conditioning in, in the, in the afternoon evenings. Uh, and then just, just hanging out with the guys. And then with a little bit of time passing, there'd be new guys getting spun in. Um, and, uh, Mikey Burnett who like that, that we were like thickest thieves. He was, he was my best friend there. And we were roommates and I spent a lot of time with Mikey. And um, so, yeah, that's just how kind of things played out like that. But we lived together, trained together. Uh, I was I was obviously the, 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 the low person in the hierarchy, as was Mikey. So we had to cook. We had to clean. There was, that stuff was not glamorous. Yeah. And I was 19 when I first got there and total mama's boy. So I didn't know I didn't know how to do my clothes. I didn't know how to cook or this, that, the other. So it was like I'm learning as I go. So um, in terms of just um, – personal development it was incredible in that regard because now i'm starting to grow up i'm starting to get uh, a bit more responsible right especially the yeah. guys, like those guys in particular like uh well, straight up like ufc celebrities at the time and like that's yeah oh big time yeah, yeah. It's, no, it's not that like, i think because i think frank uh sorry ken shamrock was heavy influenced by obviously competing in japan and japanese culture yes so he kind of implemented that like you know you had to kind of work, earn your way and work your way. And this yes. is a very, very like Japanese mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Where you start as, as a, as a student and then, you know, you got to do all the work and, and then you work your way to being like one of the regular guys. And then eventually you don't have to do that stuff anymore because the next wave of new students is doing that. So it's, it's a very, very Japanese influence mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of from Japanese culture. So and yeah, I think so Ken, Ken was, following that format 100 percent. well on the topic of this like i remember reading like back in the day when i was uh working at the warrior shop and i was yeah, Mike, 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 give me a second yeah. sorry give me a second yeah. i'll be back in a minute you guys chat oh cool. for sure sounds good yeah, dude. i remember um i just remember reading the book like yeah the tryouts like you you kind of downplayed it but from what i remember in that book is like the tryouts are apparently a big thing like it was like it was yeah. kind of a big deal can you speak on that a little bit more? Because from what I understand, like the book describes it as like a hellacious process to weed, weed out to weed out weak people. Yeah. So, so uh, it, the the crazy thing, and again, at the time, it's just this is something that's taking place. But um, that was, I think, that it was one of the first books that had been written about the lions. Then it was uh, Rich Hanner inside the lions. And I was is that the one you're talking about, or I, I think it was what what his his it's his instructional book. It's like he if that I'm not sure. It was a while back. I'm not. I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just remember it was like all his techniques and then the introduction talked about all this stuff, but conditioning and mindset. Okay. Cause that sounds, that sounds like the one. So that, that the, um, uh, the, the, the part that you would have read about the tryout, if yeah. it's the same book, which I'm thinking that was my tryout. Okay. Yeah. So it was all pseudonyms and stuff like that. There's no royalties, unfortunately, but yeah, yeah no, if, if it's, if we're talking about the same book and it sounds like we are that, that actually was my tryout and it, it was, it was, unbelievable it was like so incredibly tough like you did um i believe they were it was like a like a a swooping movement type squat and and you went to failure and you had to do a wheelbarrow walk and 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 they were just um putting you through a very grueling 
uh, tryout and is like, you just keep going until you can't go anymore. And basically you're either, you either, um, concede, I can't go anymore. Or you just get to the point where they're like, you're, 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 you're done. Right. So bar none, it was, it was like one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I just, and I remember right at the end, they said, this is the thing that did it for you. Because I think there was six of us that tried out and there's only two of us that made it. Uh, well, one of the last things that we had to do was uh, kicks on tie pads. And I just remember like just boom, boom, like just, I was just trying to go as, as hard and as fast as I could. Boom, 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 just trying to knock out those kicks. And I, and I was getting incredibly tired. I was already incredibly tired, but just the, the, the fatigue was just like boosting up exponentially. But they said the fact that you show from, from end to end that you were willing to push through it all, that's what, uh, that's what helped me because there was three of us that made it to the end. Um, and, uh, there, he selected two of us and for whatever reason to this day, I still don't know why, um, the other guy who made it, he ended up having to bow out. So then I ended up being the only person who actually carried forward, moved into the house and so on. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, so in that case, it's so the metric that they were looking for when they were looking for new fighters, is like, can you keep pushing when things got tough more or less? hundred percent. So yeah. yeah. Even if, even if it, it wasn't the cleanest technique or you weren't like, as long as you were showed, like you wanted to get there. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Man, that's nutty. Yeah. Absolutely, okay. Man. Oh, I think that's like, no, that, that, that's, that's a surreal that you got to have that experience. That's uh, it was, cool. it really was the show of wills. Show. It's basically what it comes down to when it comes to professional fighting. If you're going to fight in the cage or the ring, it's a show of will. If you don't have that will to go and keep fighting and keep going under massive duress, then you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those things like if, if you know, coming, if, if I'm trying to relate my, to the mindset of Ken and, and what he's trying to do, I was like, man, if I'm going to invest time and give these guys opportunities to fight in Japan or whatever, and I'm going to invest, you know, my energy to try and train these guys. I want to make sure they're not going to crumble on the first fight or, you know, or so on and so on. Uh, having heart is, and, and determination is a huge factor in success in this game, in this fight game. So I can see he's like trying to weed out, you know, the, the, the guys that are not mentally prepared for, for that mm -hmm. kind of uh, training and that kind of environment. Uh, so good on you, my friend. Good on yeah, you. Sure, Thanks, man. Uh, I guess if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're, we've touched on the time skip there, but uh, if we're fast forwarding back towards the end of the career, then, uh, so you're, are, you, are you still heavily involved in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu community or how are you playing it now? Okay. So, um, the, the, as far as that timeline goes, um, sitting around with my buddies in 93, watch the first UFC, we're definitely doing that. <laughs> um, I had like a bunch of uh, back then you, you, you try to get your hands on whatever uh, training resource you can. There's black belt magazine. That was a big thing. And I remember reading about an article in the Gracie's and just talking about they're, they're unstoppable, so on and so forth. So the UFC comes out, my buddies weren't aware of these guys. I said, I'll tell you right now, I'm calling it. Hoist Grace is going to win. There's, there's no bones about that. And uh, he's like, are you kidding me? Like look at the size disparity, so on and so forth. And then, they, and then they watch him just impose his will and then it's like the next day at the gym, the Japanese jujitsu gyms, like this is what we're doing. And then uh, you do the best that you can with the resources that are available. So the Gracie Basics videos, uh, Henzo Gracie, Craig Kuka, like any any videos, VHS videos that were available, <laughs> yes. to, right? You get your hands <laughs> on it and then you study together, you train, you try to learn and you just spend as much time uh, on the mats as you can. And uh, in that so there's, the, there's the kind of like the baseline for the grappling. Um, and then I was very fortunate, made it to, to Lions Den, competed for, for – well, I was there for a year, came back, uh, and then was training locally. And um, uh, once, I, once I pursued like the, the, the law enforcement career, kind of put it on the shelf for a bit, but then came back to it. Uh, it's probably around 2007. So oh. now, like now, I'm like in my 30s, and I was training with the with a guy named Jerry DeSanto in St. Catharines. His gym is a defensive arts training center, and I think he's a third degree under Seneca. And uh, he was a real strategist. He could really. He's not, put to, he's, he's not really a, a, a hugely involved in the community. That's I think that's why people don't really hear about him too much. Uh, if you bring his name up, or he's a third degree, and who even I don't even people. People like I know, but a lot of people don't even know who Seneca is, right? So, 
he's kind of been under the radar, kind of quiet for forever. So, but yeah. I do know who you're talking about, though. Yeah, quite quite professional, really good strategist. Um, he uh, he he has certainly helped some people. And again, this is stuff that's off the radar. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, Phil Van and Buchel, he he definitely came up the ranks through Brock Wrestling, but uh, he decided he wanted to take a run at grappling, and that was when they had uh, a Canadian. Uh, trials for Abu Dhabi before North Americans. It was when the North Americans were in Vernon, BC. So Phil decided he was going to do it. Jerry worked out the strategy. Phil won. Phil Phil won his weight class at Canadians and then competed at the North Americans. And unfortunately, he drew Jamal Patterson in the first round. They had a great match. You're talking about a, uh, uh, ADCC, right? Yeah, Abu Dhabi. You're talking yeah, about ADCC. ADCC. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, back then it was like, Hey, I got an opportunity to do this, uh, um, tournament. So I was running, like doing some conditioning stuff with Phil, but he was really putting in his time and, um, and he won that went to North Americans, had some great matches. Like he went against Jeff Glover. He went against hey. like, someone, I don't uh -huh. think it was the, uh, ADCC that he did, uh, the, the event at Jeff with Jeff Glover, but other tournaments when he was out West, mm. that would have been one of the guys that he, that he went against. But in any case, um, Getting back to Jerry, Jerry was good strategist, and uh, the the tr the training, it it, it was good, mm -hmm. and um, he he, and it, like I'm really glazing over some stuff about the history with Jerry because because Jerry is the one with gentle persuasion who got me to come back into BJJ. So whatever I accomplish, thank you, Jerry, because he was the one that got me back into it. So he was also the one that got me into uh, competing in IBJJF. So mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, there really wasn't too many tournaments on the East Coast for IBGF, and the New York Open, boom, there it is, gi tournament. So Jerry, uh, Jerry says, okay, "We're going to that one." So uh, Jerry competed, I competed, Paul Federici, good dude, I really like Paul. He competed, and um, oh my goodness, Vince, Vince Cristelli competed, and uh, that exposure and and the opportunity to compete now at my age group, it actually went pretty good, and I, I silvered in my weight class. Uh, so, so now it's like, Hey, you know what? Now I'm like kind of back in the group cause I've done some locals, but now it's IBJJF. So I decided to do, uh, um, uh, Mundials okay. and, uh, career wise, there, there was simply stuff going on where, um, I needed to shift. So I was training, uh, with defensive arts training center, but then I was also training with fight club Canada. So that's Vince Mate. And, and so the, the, the path kind of changes a little bit here. Right. So, um, I was training uh, at Fight Club with Vince, and his his jujitsu is off the charts. It's ridiculous. He, his knowledge base is incredible, uh, incredible lineage. He spent a lot of time in Brazil. He he went up the ranks with Astia, uh, got his black belt from Marcio Fitosa through Carlos Gracie Jr. And um, so, again, it's just circumstances in which I I, I went from training with Jerry to training uh, with Vince, and um, uh, continued continued for some time. And uh, then as, as they would have it, so now this is kind of moving on to, to 2012, uh, I got the itch to do Nogi because that's nice. where I really kind of put my, my efforts into uh, when I first started training at Lions. And it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's Nogi, it's sub submission wrestling. Uh, and I love the leg stuff. So it was kind of cool that, uh, that I ended up there because I was always kind of like uh, mesmerized by Ken's uh, proficiency with his leg locks. Um, so... Um, I did Nogi Pans, and, which East Coast, and Sam Yoss, who's a black, well, he's now a black belt, but he was one of the guys at uh, Fight Club and then Evolve. Um, he was doing some training just to kind of get guys geared up for competition, and I got hurt. I had no idea how hurt I was, so this is another connection for Marco and I. But uh, <laughs> yeah. compete, competed at uh, Nogi Pans. spoken about this many a times. <laughs> uh, we have spoken about this many times. Yeah, man. Uh, double silvered at Nogi Pans. So nice. it was, like, good go. So it's like, all right, um, you know what? Maybe this is the time. So because my exposure or my competition uh, outcome with the Mundials in 2009, 2010, first round, uh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't make it out. Mm -hmm. So I go to um, the Pyramid, Long Beach in 2012. And that, that was my Cinderella story. Um, it's not like I had some crazy new strategy or, 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 or tactics or this, that, the other, I, 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 I played my strategy the way that I have basically all this time, but for whatever reason on that day, everything was connecting the sun, the moon, the stars, everything was perfect alignment. Um, I won my weight class at heavyweight. So I was a purple belt, 
uh, senior one, which it no longer even exists anymore, but it was the senior one division. Um, won my weight class. I took the gold there and went into open weight. And uh, it, it was incredible again. So I'm pretty sure it was an ultra heavy that I, he was a bronze medalist from the ultra heavy that won that match. Probably one of the biggest, um, you know, kind of like what I feel great about is uh, in the, the s- semifinals, I went against the gold medalist from super heavy. So one way class above me, fortunate won that one. Then I went against Leonardo Gonzalez, who is just unbelievable. And uh, he had won uh, middleweight and I ended up getting caught. Um, so, but still, if it, so if, if nothing ever happened no, again, uh, brother, so throughout this whole thing, um, how did you deal with the back issues and okay. how was that? Like, how long were you derailed because of that? And now, I mean, you're back at it again Yeah. and training again. I can see that you're training again. And by the way, I, I will, um, agree with Matt here on how great Vince is. He's a fantastic professor. We have been friends for a while. He's, he's really, really good. Again, one of those guys under the radar. You don't really hear too much, but he's a, he's a really good professor and he does a really good job with his students. So, um, th- so before the injury thing, cause my, my path has continued because, and it ties into some of your previous episodes. Um, life happens. We know that we end up going kind of different courses and such. And, um, things reached a point where I was training with Vince where it just simply was not possible to continue with him. And I had trained with him for 12 years longer, this, that, the other. So with much agony, um, the day I figured out what day it was going to be. I met him at the gym and I was like, Hey, can, can I talk with you for a couple seconds? So he was done his class. We went off the side. I explained everything that was going on with my life and, and where things were. And, uh, and I had to bow out from, from, uh, training with Vince and I, and I trained, um, in a new gym, but w- having the conversation, it was like, it, this sucks. And I could tell he was disappointed. He was totally cool, but he was very disappointed and, and it was tough to, to even have that conversation. But to me, it yeah. needed to be had. And uh, so now I'm training. Right. Uh, sorry, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So now I'm training right. under that way. You don't burn a bridge. Yeah. Uh, so I'm training under a, a Gringo affiliate. Uh, so I train with um, uh, Kevin Manns, uh, Reggie Traver, and Scott Jutris. And obviously we're under uh, Fernando Zulik. So that's that's uh, that's where I train uh, now. Mm. Um, and that's also glazing over um, 2019 Nogi Worlds. So it was a great go, um, but the back the back issue because that's a huge huge thing. Um, training for Nogi Pans in 2012 would have been mid September 2012. Training with a guy um, went for uh, a takedown. He sprawled. That happens a million times. But I felt and heard a pop in my back. And at the t- and at the t- but at the time I didn't know what it was. You got your adrenaline, so you keep training. And I just noticed that there was a tightness, a tightness, kind of like, um, uh, kind of like low back, kind of running along the, the the butt, right? And I've always been a huge advocate of um, preventative care, so sports chiropractor, RMT, physio, all that kind of stuff. And I've been fortunate because for the most part, I respond quite well to it and I would get a temporary relief, but then it tightened right back up again. And like, we all know our body better than anybody else. I knew something was wrong, but I had no idea how bad it was until after Noki world. So I was uh, very thankful, uh, very grateful for how well it went. And I felt, you know what, I can afford to take some time now to uh, figure out what's going on. So now working through the minimally invasive procedures. Uh, and that's, that's excluding chiro, physio, RMT, osteo, all that. Um, PRP, so blood plasma injections, I had that done. Uh, nerve blocks, epidurals, and just it was not coming together. So um, when I was getting my PRP treatment, it was at uh, the Institute of Sports Medicine. And that's uh, Dr. Gallia, who's, who's an incredible person. He, he's run, he had run to some things in the past, but that man is a healer. There's no bones. And if, if uh, physicians were as tenacious as that guy, I think society would probably be uh, much healthier because he did not want to give up on me. So Mm -hmm. he did the treatment and he was not satisfied with what he saw. So he had uh, requisitioned a second MRI and and put me into contact with some other um, uh, physicians. And I'm very thankful for that. And it was the second MRI that revealed that I had a herniated disc. Oh, so uh, I tried, tried to get a consult 
just try and get a consult with an Ontario neurosurgeon impossible because in, in the hierarchy, my, uh, my quality of life was not so adversely affected by the, by their criteria that would even warrant a consultation. But again, we know our bodies better than anybody else does. And I, I made a decision. Um, there are many things that we can spend money on. Uh, and for me, quality of life, I will, I will spend whatever I need to spend. So, uh, one of the many chiros that I was going to, uh, had said, uh, there's a surgical group called laser spine Institute. They no longer exist anymore. Hmm. Um, but there's a, there's a surgical group LSI and I have, I have a patient, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to, to, to my patient and see if we can try and, and, and create some opportunity for you to be able to, to, to get more information. And through that, um, I, I learned more about LSI and reached out to them, sent them my MRI results. And then it, it was, it was, it was a money thing. So, uh, give them a call. You are a viable candidate. Okay. So let's talk costs. Okay. So this surgery is going to cost you 22,500 us dollars. And at the time the exchange was good. So it worked out to about, yeah, I know I see Marco. Um, it worked out to 25 or just a smidge under 25,000 Canadian dollars. And I was prepared, I was prepared to take the debt. It, I did not have that money. It was a debt that I was fully prepared to take. So once you get past the money, okay, so how, uh, how does this work? When, when would I be able to schedule the, the appointment? Well, it all depends on where you want to, how far you want to travel. I'll go wherever I need to. Will you come to West coast, come to Arizona? Sure. We'll get you in in two weeks. Blood work, MRI, x-ray, diagnostics, conducted, completed, debriefed the same day, right? Yeah. Had the surgery done. They had, they had a five, a five day, uh, uh, protocol from, from the, you do all your tests and you get your surgery, you have a, a rest period and then back on the plane and off you go. And, uh, that was an extremely positive experience for me. And again, you have to make those decisions. Uh, some people would not be willing, would, would not listen. Let me know. Some people may not be in a position to take on that kind of financial burden. I, Fortunately, was in a position to do that, so I did. I have zero regrets, and I would encourage people to give consideration to uh, whatever medical options are even possibly viable. So whether that's Canada, the United States, or elsewhere, because you, you only have one life, and quality yeah. of life is is so so important, right? Well, well beyond after your competitive years with with jujitsu or MMA. Um, you, you still have a life to live. And, uh, to me that, that is such critical, uh, such critical stuff. So because it was such a positive experience, I, I highly, highly recommend it. And it got me back on the mats and I competed at Nogi worlds, double bronze at Nogi world. So, and again, that none of that would have been possible unless I had the opportunity to seek the medical treatment, get a minimally invasive, uh, back procedure at L5 S1. And uh, lots of time to heal. I was away from the mats for, for years. And, of course, making the mistakes, trying to come back too soon. Nope, you're on the shelf even longer. You're going to have to wait longer. And that was just my own foolishness. I fully accept that. And um, it took time. But then I eventually got back to the mats and then had a great outcome. And, and, and that outcome was because of um, the graciousness of my training partners who, who gave me probably the greatest thing that anybody can ever give you, which is their time. So Vince, Andrew Newlands, um, Bill Hermosa, Rick Heaton, Chad Leeson. Um, and some of these guys would be like, okay, who, who are these guys? They're, they're all high, high speed guys. Um, and they, and they helped me. And the reason why I did well was because I had their support and I had their help. So like, we don't do it alone. They're, those, those medals are team medals, hundred percent. Dude, you're, uh, you're painting a really you're a good case for privatized medical care, but uh, let's not get into that. Well, <laughs> Well, this is what I was just going to say as far as like, uh, you know, we are in a very fortunate country to be, you know, very fortunate to be in Canada and what it provides. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, free medical care does not necessarily mean the best medical care. Uh, that's what you pay for when you go in the U.S. Yes, it's extremely costly and uh, and like you were saying, but you get everything done right away. I don't have to wait three months for an MRI, you know. Uh, I don't have to wait. Uh, you pay and you get the service right away. And not only do you get the service right away, for the most part, you get the best service right away because of the amount of money that you're paying. 
Um, and yeah, there's so many uh, viable options that you can take. Uh, world globally, I mean, I've heard of things that I could do for my neck if I'm willing to travel to to Germany. Um, I have looked at a few different uh, other options, even in Colombia, because it would be so much cheaper to do it down there than to do it up here. So, I mean, there, there, there are there are things in place, and and I agree with Matt. Is what are you willing to do, and how far are you willing to go to to get these things corrected and it's not easy man i've been living with neck issues for a long time and you know what the funny thing is it happened the exact same way uh, exact same way that uh where i had issues that i started having issues with my neck i went in for a double leg on tony he was getting ready for a fight i went in for a hard double i managed to get him down but then my whole right side went numb my whole right arm went dead for like almost a minute couldn't feel my arm and then, you know, I was came back. I was fine. Trained for a few more days, and then again, and then constant tingling in my hand for like a couple of weeks. And then I'm like, okay, this is not good. Went to see the doctor. Had to wait a little bit longer. We're still training with the numbness in my hand and stuff. Then I finally saw a sur managed to see a surgeon, and he's like, uh, got the MRI done. From the time I got the result of the MRI to the time I was having surgery was a week. They're like, we have to rush you through because one more bad like impact, one more bad hit, and that's it. You're losing feeling in your arm for good. <laughs> so it was quick, man. By the time there was the, the result of the MRI to the surgery was like seven days. It was in and out surgery. I went with the least invasive one, um, which is just uh, decompression. Uh, but uh, and I, I'm okay with that decision. I, I was ma I managed to go back and train, and I managed to do a lot of things. But then you know how it is; time goes by, and wear and tear, and then the issues started coming back. And uh, it, I'm okay now because I've taken some measures to to make the things things better. But it's not 100% ideal either, because it's just like right C4, five, and six. It's where every basically where your head connects to your body. It's it's not the best places. Mm -hmm. You guys got me uh got me <laughs> you guys got me concerned about how I want to play it safe now in terms of just like trying to keep myself safe as I continue computing. One, one it's a thing. marathon, man. It's not so a much sprint. better. I have a hard no, time. It's, and it's so much better now. <laughs> Things are so much better now. Like we're smarter now. We know better now. Back then it was like, oh you're hurt? Too bad. Keep training. Mm -hmm. You know, now we're encouraging all professors and instructors who have been around in the game. We're like, you get hurt. We're like, no, man, stay home, heal, go see somebody. I won't let guys train if they're hurt. They're not. I won't let them on the mat until they get some kind of clearance or they see somebody. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. if it's a severe injury. You know, even Michael, how I told you, get it checked out, right? Yeah. You had an injury, and I was like, go get it checked out. Make sure you don't like, don't train if it's if you don't feel good because it's gonna make it worse. And I bugged you about it, right? So, yeah. and super right. important to be, to be careful. What if you're injury? If you're injured out there, kids, and it doesn't feel right, that means you should look after it and take your time to get back on the mat. Don't rush back on the mat. It's the mats are not going anywhere. They're going to be there waiting. Just make sure you heal up 100 percent so you can come back 100 percent. Matt, uh, we've kind of glazed over, actually. There's something I'm really curious about the, in terms of the your rank in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and then also the way you started in MMA. If you were training the Lions Den, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not exactly a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu camp, is it? Right. Like, no, 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 no. They were like, yeah. So in that case, how did that transition work? Did you just come in at, like, did you just come in as a white belt when you start doing Jiu-Jitsu? Or, oh, and, you just, and then by the time it was 2009, you, were, you, you got your purple belt? Or... Uh, yeah, I'd have to pull up my IBJJF uh, belt records to give you the, the, the specific dates, but um, I think it was like 2007 when, when I started training with Jerry, and then I worked my way up to blue belt under under uh, J Jerry and Seneca, yeah? yeah, and then um, uh, it was right around that time that I ended up training uh, with Vince. And then I got my promotions for purple and brown with Vince, uh, okay, that but yeah, it's 
you know what, I've got no problems taking the humility pill, you know, regardless of, of what skill sets I bring in. There is, there is a curriculum. There is a familiarization of technique with no gi or gi. There's a familiarization, submissions, awareness. The so, And actually, Marco, all these years, one of the things that Marco has always held true to was the self-defense aspect mm-hmm. of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Many, many times, over 20-something years, he'd always say, yeah, that's great that you're good in sports jiu-jitsu. Come over here. Boom. Okay, I've got you in a rare bear hug. What are you going to do? So, you know, there, there's so much learned. I'm not even saying that I know that stuff, but I respect Marco's uh, stance on, on the, the need uh, for, like, the total uh, elements of, of the BJJ to include the self-defense too, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I mean, I've always been a, a big proponent of it because that's what I started and that's what I did. But I also understand the, the value in it. And I just I think that's you know, one of the things that I, maybe you're probably going to agree with me. And I don't know if I've mentioned in previous podcasts. And that's the, the, the reason that self-defense is not so popular is because of two things that I see. One the sport is way more addictive. It's a lot more instant gratification, right? You're in there hands-on, right? So the sport will always uh, uh, grab people's uh, uh, emotions and attention much, much quicker. The other thing is like we are very fortunate to live in a country that's pretty safe. Yes. So the need the need for self-defense is not really there in like in the day in every, in the majority of life, everybody's day to day life is only certain pockets of the city that you have to worry about it. And it's not really like in your face. Right. So you can live your whole life. Like I, I have mentioned this before, you can live your whole life in this amazing country without actually seeing a real act of violence. Mm. Like real violence. I'm not talking about like a few street scuffles. I'm talking about like real violence. Uh, and I think that's that's, and I think that's one of the main reasons it's such a hard sell for the self defense. I think originally what happens every time is people come in with the notion, oh, I want to learn how to defend myself. I teach them that stuff, but the second they get addicted to the sport, it becomes secondary, or it becomes like I don't want to do it at all, and that's the hard part, and that's the challenging part. But I think it's a, it's, I don't want it to be a, a, a lost art form or a lost element. I think there's, and we're going to get into this, like, in a, as far as like the value of it as a system for other um, uh, professions, such as first responders, right? I think first responders, the, the value that the Jiu Jitsu can bring to them, uh, what the self defense and the tactics and the combatives is, is huge. All right, f- for those individuals, it may not be for everybody, and that's cool. I think it should be an intro- at least introduced to it, and that's what I do. I introduce self defense in my novice curriculum, but then once you get into intermediate curriculum, we just focus on the sport. If you want to continue with the self defense, we can go deeper into it if that's your choice. But I find the majority just want to stick with the sport, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I guess that kind of basically. S- you know, goes into this, uh, our next uh, kind of uh, topic here, and that's uh, you are a police officer. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. So uh, the, the, the profession, I, I consider it a vocation because I, I, I believe in looking out for people. I believe in, in, in doing right. And um, as fate would have it, my reporting day to commence my recruit training was 9-11. Oh, yeah. Wow. So there's a tremendous symbolism to me, and um, I consider what I do a vocation. I don't consider that just some job that I do. I, I genuinely believe in in the value of what it is that I do. So yeah. Now, as you all know, there's some crazy things going on down south, uh, all because of certain individuals and their behavior. Now. I don't know if you're if you if you can elaborate a little bit, but is there a major difference between police training in Canada and in the U.S.? So one more time. Is there a huge difference in training between Canada and the U.S.? So 
um, here, it, it, for me, it would be unfair to, um, to try to give a, a true comparison because, because of ignorance. I, I am not familiarized with uh, U.S. law. I'm not familiarized with their adequacy standards for, for, their, for their training. Uh, I guess I I'm, I'm, would be in a better position to talk about the training that, that we have here. And the benefit, certainly in Ontario, is that it is um, tremendously regulated and that there is a consistency. So if you're uh, a municipal police officer, or if you're a provincial police officer, you all train together. You go through all the same curriculum. So it is very much standardized. There are provincial adequacy standards that, that, that stipulate the, 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 the content of material you're learning, how much time is placed into, into the learning, and so on. So I, I could certainly pr pr provide that to you. Now, it, it, once you go to the police college and you're now uh, you know, a, a regular police officer, doing you know doing like basically on the street you're doing your job is it mandated that you train you know a certain amount of hours in de-escalation and like physical contact altercation is that like is there a mandate that you have to do a certain amount of hours or is that on you as an individual to decide how much you want to put in with that no, it, it's very much regulated by provincial adequacy standard, and um, the 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 regulations as to what what uh, content you, you're you're doing, like how much hours is allocated to this, that, and the other. It's very very much regulated. So it's not like oh, I feel like doing my requalification training. No, 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 no. You you will be going through your training because it is it is a part of uh, your responsibilities, like under the Police Services Act. There there are there are very prescriptive standards that you have to meet and that that has to be done uh, um, on a very regimented basis. Because I think the, a lot of the, 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 the heat that uh, police officers in the U.S. are getting, I'm not sure if it's across the nation. Uh, I've just heard, you know, through several podcasts that, that I've listened to that they, they're only mandated four hours a year of like, combatives training four hours per year how is that i mean it just doesn't make sense to me because when you're dealing with physical artications and you know and knowing how to control people's bodies and and making sure you if you're going to do your job in a safe manner where both yourself and you know the person that you are apprehending is safe as well I feel like they have it maybe a little bit backwards, and I don't know if you can agree with me or not, but that I think so many situations doesn't need to lead to them pulling off their gun or, or whatever. I think there can be better training um, to deal. I mean, I understand if there's a gun involved, a knife or, you know, or some kind of a weapon, but if none of those things are involved, I, I feel that there could be better ways to manage people physically. Obviously, I'm biased towards jiu-jitsu, but how do you see that? I think um, policing the 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 um, the job could always be done better. I think all anything that we do, we could always do it better. Mm -hmm. um, I just think reflecting on some. I think it would have been the the, the podcast previous to this. Um, one and there was a lot of amazing points that got brought up by by everyone. By the way. Um, I think it's right out of the gate, how you are um, interacting with a person can have a major uh, impact on how that um, interaction ultimately uh, uh, unfolds. So, cause I think you had talked about, you know, the, the, this concept of like an empathy and empathetic kind of approach and uh, an understanding approach. I think how you, how you speak to people and um, verbally engage that can have a tremendous effect on how things uh, carry forward. And I think uh, by having that, uh, having that ability to, to effectively communicate, verbally communicate, uh, there may not be a need for any, any force, right? Mm -hmm. if, we, if, if someone can be, if, if it's a case where someone needs to be taken into custody, if that can be accomplished just simply through, through dialogue and conversation, yeah. Perfect. 
That is the right. ideal. And I think there's always room for improvement, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, in your opinion, would it be possible to have more of a jiu-jitsu curriculum, like combative jiu-jitsu curriculum, implemented in the future? Do you think that would be ideal? I only say this, and I, I mean, I'm sure you heard me in my previous in the previous episode, mm -hmm. that how easily you can manipulate people when you have a high skill set in jiu-jitsu and how you would be able to manipulate people and control them where you keep them action safe and protect them from themselves and keeping yourself safe as well. Mm -hmm. So do you think that jujitsu would be something that can potentially be implemented in police departments? So um, again, like tr I'm trying to, to look at this from, from broad perspective uh, it is. It actually is. It, it has been for, for, for quite some time. The mm -hmm. challenge is that it takes tremendous time to make the necessary changes because mm -hmm. you have a finite time period and you have a whole bunch of skills that need to be uh, inculcated into these uh, recruits to maintain those skill sets carrying forward for, for the officers so the, the true challenge is the time. Time is always the, 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 going to be one of the greatest obstacles to be able to make sure you're meeting the standards that need to be met as it is mm -hmm. and then find a way to potentially bring in even more um, training, for example, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But um, the, the, those efforts for sure are, are in play. Well, I, you know, I'm sure you're aware that the police college here in Toronto has got several uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. They train there. They have the uh, 5 BJJ program uh, in that, and that they're encouraging more and more officers to train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They have a great facility. They're a huge mat space. Mm -hmm. And I think for years they've been kind of like encouraging this, um, this training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with the self-defense aspect of it as well. But I think, you know, having just that one location, I mean, how do you multiply that to every single department? You know, if, if you think of it, just, just think of this for a second. If your department where you go to work every day had a mat area, right? Uh, because, and I'll explain why I'm, why I'm directing it this way. Because I know that there's a lot of BGG academies saying, hey, let's help the officers. We'll let you train for free until you get your blue belt or We'll, we'll give you some discounts and stuff to have in, and encourage police officers to come and train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at academies. But I think you can go further as to wouldn't you prefer to go into your department and have a mat room there and you train specifically for scenarios with your fellow colleagues? And then if you're not working, then on your off days or whatever, you, you can train. You can have scheduled classes with an instructor that runs classes regularly in the department wouldn't that be more um you know uh the better way to go instead of just having uh police officers train at academies because remember it's going to be heavily directed towards the sport and then that may not be a hundred percent the best uh crossover to dealing with individuals on the street so um the the inherent danger is that while we know that uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is very effective at being able to control somebody, there's a, a, number of a number of additional factors that need to come into play. So um, does the police service uh, deem this to be suitable and therefore mm -hmm. authorize this to be right. uh, incorporated into lesson plans that are court defendable? Because... Uh, one could argue, and I mean, we are, we're biased because obviously our, 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 we, we have a real passion for BJJ and we believe in the effectiveness of BJJ. And so does the, the person with the same concepts in judo, mm -hmm. in Krav Maga, mm -hmm. in Muay Thai, in mm -hmm. boxing, in this and this and this and this and this and this. So, that, so maybe there's some competing perspective on what would be the most suitable thing to, um, to, to boost uh, officer skills. Um, 
is it something that the again like so now we're going looking at liability perspective and uh, uh, something that uh, the senior command staff are going to have to answer to uh, is it believed that this is uh, appropriate or would the techniques that are going to be taught and taught to everybody so mm -hmm. whether it's um, a, a a brand new recruit officer or somebody who's at the tail end of their career and um, do do they have the same degree of youth? athleticism, agility, flexibility, everybody that is, uh, is an officer will go through the training. So it, it must be done by every single officer. So there's a challenge mm -hmm. of what techniques do you want to uh, propose to have um, uh, presented for consideration for uh, authorization, for lesson plans, right. and then making sure that you subject that to um, the, the concepts of, of defensive tactics and making sure that, it's, that it, it's, it's appropriate and that it is something that could be used and defended in court if for whatever reason something uh, catastrophic were to occur. And, that, and that's the real right. challenge with it. Having uh, mat rooms in, uh, in your facilities, now you're looking at potential liability issues because even though we know you could train very, very safely in jiu-jitsu, we also know that you can get injured. So now from the administrative organizational standpoint, is that a duty injury? Was that an injury? Do you see what I mean now? Yeah. We're bringing in some variables that oh, maybe, God. Maybe, maybe we're not uh, necessarily uh, looking or, or, or initially maybe giving some consideration to because now- Insurance. Um, 100%. <laughs> we get so, insurance. <laughs> so so you're, you're on your lunch. Right. And maybe you're permitted to do uh, some some uh, some jujitsu. So you're doing some rolling, you're doing some technique and, and now you're injured. Right. Well, you're on your lunch. You're also working. So now where does that fall into play? And, and, you, and you are going to see nuances in say, a collective bargaining agreement, because now the union or well, the, the, the association, right. we're certainly going to have a say. In, in, in what's going on there. So now we just, we're going to continue to incorporate more variables into, into this and why it, it, it would be, obviously I, like, I would love it. I know you I'm getting that same vibe from you. There's a, a lot of additional factors that will come into play that can create uh, major obstacles, like with like an infinite possibility that would be incredible, but given the, the operational constraints, is it possible? So now, how many people are training because you still need to have um, officers uh, on the road patrolling. You still need to have officers engaged in, in de detective services. You still need to have officers engaged in emergency services. So now uh, what is the size of, of, of that, of that class taking place is the person who would be the lead in the position to be able to teach, or is it maybe inexperienced people who have the, the enthusiasm and the heart and, and the attentiveness to learn, but now they don't have the person who uh, is in the position to, to teach. And now um, is the service going to be imposing certain restrictions on who it is that's teaching? Is it going to be a qualified use of force instructor? That's well, that's what I was going to. You know what I mean? That was going to be my next. That was going to be my next question. Like, if this was to go ahead, um, and you know, which I hope you know that it does eventually at some point. I think that progress is important. Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, especially if you want to change the perception. And, and the stigmas that are out there, we need to do something. Um, but is it, it, would it be a case that, okay, can you hire a regular civilian like myself, or do you need to hire in like within the de police department? So you would have to get someone to go and train and then come and bring it back, uh, you know, or is it okay to hire a, a civilian to do, to run a program within the police department? I guess that would be, you know, uh, another challenge in itself. For sure it would. I think uh, if, you, if you look at how conventional training is facilitated, typically it's going to be the person who has gone through their training to become a use of force instructor that's now going to add on more um, specialization courses. They, 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 can, uh, they can facilitate more types of training. And if you're fortunate enough, and certainly in the case in Toronto, uh, where you have very skilled, experienced uh, BJJ athletes, they take um, say a law enforcement oriented um, uh, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu program. So like the Gracie Survival Tactics is just one example. I, I'm sure there's, there's many more, but being one example where it's very much uh, law enforcement based, um, it then comes down to whether or not uh, the senior command believe that that is appropriate 
to to include in programming but there's like there's many steps that need to go through to make sure that it, it's not like oh that's a great idea let's do that and let's uh let's piecemeal it like i like this i like this i like this i like this that's the ideal mm-hmm. world but the reality is there's a number of factors that come into play um is are there instances where an outside contractor could facilitate service um there there are like as far as um say like uh, firearms training, for example, that, that uh, instructors or tactical units will go on, they, they, they will seek out outside vendors who have uh, various skills like subject matter experts and such. But again, you're, the, the, those uh, instructional courses are being provided to people who most certainly have that baseline and, and, that, and that mastery of whatever, whatever skill sets they have to begin with. And now they're building on what they, on what they have. Right. So even if it was somebody who say like was, was hired by say the police service as, as a, as a, uh, I, I'm not even sure. Cause this is so exploratory. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for example, Marco, uh, gets hired by police service X and, uh, they, they figure out some specific role, civilian role, or, or, or would it be civilian? Would it be a sworn role? And his, the scope of his responsibility is going to be this. Um, it's an interesting, interesting uh, thought. And it, it, would, it would be amazing discussion. Let's put it that way. My personal mm-hmm. extrapolation of all this is actually, like, there seems to be a giant movement of, like, on in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community of, like, every police, uh, police, uh, police officer should at least be a blue belt or something, right? So, but from what I gather here, it's like, it doesn't like in terms of yeah, listen, it's not actually that feasible within a year or two. It's like this is like a decade or two. What does that mean exactly? Sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but what does that mean exactly? A blue belt in BJJ, what if it's specific, <laughs> just specifically sport based, it don't mean anything. Yeah. So, there's no self defense or no uh, uh, like idea of certain scenarios and certain attacks and certain environments, then it doesn't correlate. Okay, so there's right? there's the only thing that you is going to be good at is going to be okay. You're going to have a, a certain uh, amount of body awareness. Yes, you're going to be able to understand basic positioning, like holding someone in mouth, knee on the belly, or even back, and so on and so on. You'll have an understanding of some takedowns, great, you know, and 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 doing some throws, but it's beyond that. It's beyond that, and I don't think this is where we, I have issues with that. So the, the, yes, it will be healthier because you're working out and you're rolling and you're doing all sorts of stuff. So there's definitely some plus, some positives to it, but I think there's certain things that are missing as well. So there, there's tons of good points that have been raised, and I'll, I'll try to see if I if I can uh, like dovetail. So um, groups such as uh, Invictus, uh, um, the there one one of the founders is out west, Ari Nazin, and there, there's an officer in the United States. Um, and their, their big push is hashtag BJJ make it mandatory. There's also jujitsu five Oh in the United States. And, um, I think it's that same kind of theme. So I believe their, their, um, their intent, what, what they're hoping to do is, is, is genuine and pure. They, they want to, um, uh, try to promote the idea that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu could could most certainly benefit officers, and that that it should take an even more uh, involved part of of, of curriculum in, in training. More uh, reg- regulatory issues can create a lot of challenges to be able to meet, and I, I think it's amazing that this is something that they are trying to do, and they're very passionate. Um, it's just very challenging. It's, it, there's so many complex issues that come into play and just like the things that, that, that we've spoken about, um, you know, like adequacy standards, mm. uh, authorization, mm. legal department, assessing it, uh, appropriate lesson planning, making sure that it's court defendable. Does it align with uh, the provincial, uh, use of force? You know, there's so many, yeah, it's, it's a complex, <laughs> it's a complex issue. And one, and, and I don't know if it was. Jiu-Jitsu 5 or uh, or Leo, or sorry, uh, in, Invictus, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Collective, that ha- had proposed the idea of saying, uh, we want to see all uh, police officers uh, reach the, the, the rank of blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I'm not, or it could have been an, an, another group that, uh, that proposed it. But I think if you identify techniques that 
are applicable across the board and that every single officer who goes through the exact same training will be able to absorb yeah. it, retain it, and be able to utilize it in an effective manner, that's a great thing. But again, lots of uh, complex issues to be able to reach that point. If that, I don't know if that, if I've really spun oh. circles or anything, but it's just oh. it's very complex. Mm -hmm. So my last, my last question is regarding this topic is who would be best suited to push this forward? Would it be a group like the 5-0 group already in the police college, in the police department? Would they be the ones that could, hey, you know, we have this curriculum, we think it's ideal. Would they be the ones in the best position to get what we're saying, like maybe slowly moving forward with that? I think- Or would it, can it be a group from outside that goes, here's a proposal, how can we get this, you know, looked at? I think if you bring the stakeholders together, you bring the Brazilian jiu-jitsu experts, you bring the, the, bring the police officers, you bring the use of force trainers, you bring everyone together and you start to develop a strategy on how you want to lobby and how you want to bring this forward by bringing everyone together and getting, getting that, the, the, the collaborative elements taking place you will be in a much better position to develop the, the best strategy to bring it forward to the, um, uh, those in the positions of authority who would be able to give consideration to it and say, yes, right. this is something that we're willing to entertain and go through due process to get it to the point where maybe they would say, yes, this is a great idea. Um, you know, we're going to consult with the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services uh, we want to talk to the Policing Standards Division, and we want to uh, uh, speak to the, the various members of that government um, uh, entity that would oversee training standards, what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. It, so there, we would have to work through all the stakeholders. I think it's a great idea, uh, but I think bringing everyone together is the best starting point, and then to build from there. So there is a way, like there, there will be a strategy and a process to do it. I think it, it means that we all come together, which is a great thing. Right. Right. Now, is, is, um, I understand what you're saying as far as if you're trying to get it within the department, you, there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. I understand that. But so at the same time, do you think that us as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy owners, if we provide a certain service and police officers decide to take us up on that service, is that another option? Now, so if I'm if, just so I'm understanding it correctly, so you're saying so the officer would, would would join a school, train to be able to take those techniques, and then now if placed into a um, situation that would require the application of force to use those techniques. Mm -hmm. if, so um, that kind of um, plays into that whole uh, risk risk uh, uh, management. So are these, are these techniques that have been uh, authorized by the service? Is there lesson plans to outline this? Is it been deemed court defendable? Because if you have a dynamic situation and somebody utilizes some type of technique, right? It 100% falls on the officer, on the stand, um, it, whether we're talking about it in trial and say maybe a civil lawsuit, um, God forbid it goes sideways. So now maybe a coroner's inquest to mm -hmm. articulate why that technique was reasonable. And now you're, you're on the line. And then maybe as the result of that, and again, so now we're, we're really diving in, we're really in that rabbit hole now. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, so now we're looking at the lawsuit, which says, uh, Marco Costa, this instructor, this instructor, this instructor, this person, this person, this person, these training partners who, who would have been involved in the training, this technique, the officer, um, all the people within that law enforcement agency. Cause now, uh, potentially you're, when you're looking at the civil litigation, now everyone's looped into it potentially. And now the onus is on all the people to be able to articulate 
why that was reasonable. And if you fail to do so, you're looking at some major liability. And that is the inherent danger of simply saying, yeah, let's just, let's just do jujitsu. Let's, let's take this technique and, and uh, this, this will be effective. Do I believe that Brazilian jiu-jitsu is effective? 100%. And there are efforts certainly being made to incorporate that in the appropriate fashion, going through the appropriate steps to have that included into programming. And now when I say that, that's not just saying um, uh, at, at a police service, because they make some decisions, but also um, uh, by the, the training that they would do, say, at the Ontario Police College, because that kind of thing is included. And maybe people don't know, but without getting into the specifics of who's involved in what, the, the, those things are taking place and it ha and it is continually getting better, but it comes back to the time thing. It takes so long yeah. to get to that right. point, but there, and, yeah. and it's, and the important thing is just to stress the potential peril of doing something that has not yeah. gone through the checks and balances. Do I think it's a great idea for officers to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? 100% because it plays, it plays into other things. If you train, you feel that you um, have the ability to defend yourself. You have the ability to, um, you know, manage a situation altercation effectively. You're more confident. If you are more confident, you are less likely to perceive a situation as a threat. If you're not perceiving a threat, perhaps you would be that much less likely to feel the need to utilize a certain technique because of your confidence we're going to continue to work on, on, on the, uh, a conversation, a dialogue, right? A verbal exchange. Yeah. I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to be situational where I'm going to keep some distance. I'm going to look to create a barrier. I'm not looking to, there isn't a need, there isn't a pressing need to, to advance on this person and close the distance and potentially uh, incite this person because I'm getting closer to them. This is giving me time to contact more officers to come into this area and let's maybe try and really slow this down. But that bringing it back to the person has to do with a confidence thing. So I do believe without even applying the techniques, the fact that it makes you more of a confident person, that will probably have that much more of a positive impact on how you're dealing with a situation. And therein lies kind of that ultimate goal. Let's be able to take control of situations without any type of uh, altercation, right? If I'm to actually chime in here and kind of, uh, from what I've gathered from this this whole conversation, there's like three kind of situations we're like we're looking at right now. There's the current situation where it seems like police officers are relatively doing this, where they just do jujitsu on the spare time, and everything you just mentioned plays into how they do their job, and it makes it more effective. The confidence comes into play. You get more civil civil interaction between, you know, whatever whatever's happening. There's a medium term fix where you have an outside vendor that comes in that teaches Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, whether it be Marco Costa or any other figurehead in the community, and they offer a service to teach a very limited scope to, to like the police force. And then there's like the long term, the long term solution where you're systemically trying to put it in, but then you're dealing with all the things you mentioned between liability, the bureau, bureaucratic system, and like making sure that it's even like oh man, the accessibility issue make make sure that all police officers can be uh, can can do this effectively regardless of age, which isn't yep. exactly that's. I'm saying that as if it's an easy thing, but that's just that's actually actually really concerning to me. You, like a guy that's maybe the tail end of his career, like you said, versus a guy that's just a new recruit. They're not going to be doing the same kind of moves. How do you find a nice? How do you find a nice balance? And that's the catch is that they all have to be able to do whatever yeah. the technique is that gets taught to every single person. And there's a need to obviously make sure that the te the technique is pure, that they're uh -huh. doing it correctly, they're getting the proper muscle memory, and it is something that can be retained and utilized effectively when it's called upon, depending on uh, the ability for that person to be able to train. So is the technique something that could be taught, learned effectively and retained effectively with a minimal amount of time practicing it? Because that's now we're getting into yeah. a whole new thing yeah. about uh, the officer's ability to be able to train because it's certainly not uh, the conditions are not like, okay, we're going to, we're going to be constantly training. We're going to constantly be working on our defensive tactics our firearms training or this or that, the other there, you have a, a certain amount of time to be able to deliver this technique. 
And then the uh, your other responsibilities. You still need to like patrol. Control. You still need to, to engage in your investigative services, your emergency services. So there's still a whole lot of stuff going on. Ideal world would be, yeah, that would be wonderful if we could train all the time. But there, that's one of many responsibilities that an officer has to fulfill. Right. My take on this, I'm not putting words in anyone, any words in anyone's mouth here. All right, it's my take is uh, all of a sudden the jiu-jitsu for everyone doesn't seem like a very as feasible as an option. It's a very nice idea, but it's not. It's, it's just, it doesn't seem feasible right away. It's it feels like a good spirited movement, but from what I gather from this, and oh, I, listen, take, I disagree with you. My friend. I have to disagree. Yeah? Please, no, please, yeah. Jiu-jitsu is for everyone, but it can't be attained the same way by everyone. Okay. Okay. You understand what I'm saying like, it can't be absorbed the same way by everybody. I don't because of this. Please, wait, you know, wait, like that, yeah. it is for everybody. Everybody can do it, but it's not all on the same level. Mm. It's not not everybody's gonna be able to play on the same le- playing field. There's different levels that you can play at this game, and you have to just be comfortable with your level and what you're capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing. And that's not even like this is just in general for for society at whole as a whole. Uh, definitely, again, you can provide it. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a service for everyone, but you have to be smart about how and and how you provide uh, that service and and how you can keep ultimately how you keep everybody safe. For right? sure. So, like, is are, With are minimal there, amount of injuries? Yeah. Are there techniques that can be delivered? Of course, there are, and and, and there are. But uh, is it going to be something that's going to be so encompassing uh, to to truly cover off what your uh, what your Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, program curriculum is or, or another gyms because now we're looking at variances the style that and the techniques that Marco teach is going to be different from from another instructor from another instructor so now we're running into major issues of standardization if the intent is to get all yeah. police officers doing this because if it is then there's a need for the the standardization right everyone's doing the same thing right perhaps I, I spoke to you soon then I just I, I, I think that yeah. This everything you're saying makes sense, yeah, right, and and it's logical. It's logical thinking and and logical observation. Um, it's not an easy. Uh, uh, it's not just going to happen like oh we're going to do this tomorrow. Uh, I think we go back to again. Uh, we keep touching on the same subject, and that's the right minds have to come together yes. and start to plan and uh create proposals and, and and get the right people involved to to get this moving and you know and we're looking like i said i'm gonna say something here again there's a huge difference between thing how things are managed and handled in in canada and ontario and what's going on in the u.s there's big differences right and i could see how in the u.s based on what i've learned and what i've understood uh, that I'm sorry, four hours of combative training a year is just unacceptable, right? And that uh, I think they, they need more if they're gonna like they need more than just that. I think there's definitely better methods, and 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 they need to improve. And the way the, re- the way things are going down, they they need something now. They need to have some kind of solutions and some kind of steps that they need to move forward with at this point. Mm-hmm. In order to, you know, ease the tensions and the craziness that's going on, right? Yeah. But who do you go with, and what do you do, and and that's I think that's where we have to actually look at something like the Gracie Survival Tactics. They have a, a track, you know, they have a, a track. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they've been doing this for a while. Track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Many, many, many de- the track record. Yes, that's right. So they have many, 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 many police departments that have taken them up on their services and what they provide. And working with their the police departments, they have actually created a second level because now they're addressing certain things that they are okay. The, pol- the police they get feedback from the police officers, so now they have they come up with solutions. So now they have the you know they have two levels to the program, and, and uh, it seems to be a, a solid, you know. Uh, job that they're working and doing with but again the, the how do you make something like that like a nationwide mandate and all this other stuff very complicated stuff obviously but i think we need we can we go back to how this whole conversation started right which is 
we there's nothing wrong with looking for continuous growth, continuous improvement. That's jujitsu. You go from, you know, always looking for better ways to do things, more efficient ways to do things. And, and I think this is this is important that you don't stay stagnated and that you don't stay with, uh, you know, potential tactics that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old or, you know, even 20 years old, right? You just always look into better the services. And uh, I'm, this is not a shot on anyone. This is just, uh, you know, you know, the way I look at it. If you are providing a public service, right, and you are being paid technically by the government, which is paid by the people with their tax dollars, you you have uh, uh, an obligation to provide the best possible service, you know, and that means to continuously look to improve their methods, right? I think we're in a better position north of the border. I really wish the best to our southern uh, friends that they do find some solutions and that this this what's going on down there is uh, you know hopefully improved because it's it's such a ugly thing that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. no, that's, uh, it's very true. I gotta say, I, I came in here with questions, and uh, you left me with more questions. You you pulled you pulled the curtain back a bit on like uh, in terms of the actual actionable steps that. Uh, need to take place if we want to see that like this ideal become a reality so no that's all right. this has been incredibly informative thank you very much appreciate it uh, it's my pleasure and, and yeah. um again, again having the opportunity to listen because i felt it was important to to take all the the podcasts in not just between the two of you yeah. but when you would also have the guests come in it was it was important to me to, to truly have a context and it was it was awesome to listen to the last one with, with, with jason because he had a lot of awesome points that he brought up um he was saying, well, I, I'm not sure if I'm in the position. He's absolutely in the position to, to come to the table and, 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 and bring forth some, some, uh, some conversations to, to, to engage in. And I think he, he had said something to the effect of, you know, I'd love to be able to sit down and, and talk to someone. Um, I was moved by everything that he had to say. Um, there was things that, that I would love to, to be able to talk to him about. I'm not going to talk about it here for two reasons. One, I have the benefit of the hindsight bias because now I've heard it, I've had time to think about like some of the, th the things that he had raised. One, two, he's not in a position to be able to, to engage and counter back with the comments uh, that I may say. So I would, I would love to have a conversation with him. I hope at some point we I actually just get across paths with him. He seems like a, re a really cool dude. But um, to be able to sit down, say, with, with, with command staff somewhere, I, I will make it a mission to make that happen. So whether that's uh, uh, Jason and I to say, Marco, yourself, uh, or maybe it's going to be something bigger. But even if it's a, a small starting point, I think the way things can, can progress, whether we're, well, we're focusing on where we are here, the way things progress is we have fierce conversations. And rather than a fierce battle with, 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 with fists and weapons, let's have... Uh, a good discussion where maybe we, we walk in our, our views are, are very different and we walk out and our views are still very different. But the fact that we respect each other and we're willing to listen to what the other person has to say, we will be far further ahead. And, it, and it's not because that there is um, uh, an answer or a solution as a result of the discussion. Sometimes the, the, the discussion itself can give you just as good or if not a better outcome than the answer because what it seems to me is that by by presenting um some of the the other variables that come into play so like um, uh, a risk management issue an administrative issue injury issue this that the other um it's it's maybe giving you a, a different perspective on yeah. so it, it's it's a great idea to to carry forward with this but it's not going to be cut and dry it's going to be involved and and it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. but but because of that, there, there I, I feel that was a, like like just your perspective is, is awesome because it makes me think a little bit differently now. And 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 from what Mark was saying, this is not impossible. We things can move forward. We can get progress. It might be challenging, but we but we can do it. Yeah, anything's possible if there's effort, right? And I mean, I I, I spoke of those three things that uh, uh, that from our from the last episode. Uh, and that I felt 
from someone standing on the outside looking at it you know i'm kind of in the middle like seeing one side saying this and the other side saying that and i'm like okay i gotta look at it in a way where it's like what is causing the issues and how can we improve the issues so mm -hmm. i meant what i said like uh, these uh, low income uh, uh, communities that influence uh, you know people's perceptions and then we have the media who focuses on just particular one particular group because it causes this, these tensions and tensions sell divide cells mm -hmm. right and then how do we improve uh, uh, the the um, you know the perception of of police officers and how they handle their how they do their job so uh, and that's what I wanted to do with bringing you guys on was like to, okay, guys, voice your voice where you're at and what are some of the things that we can do, right? Mm -hmm. well, I, think, I think you are spot on when it comes to uh, your, 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 um, your stance, like what, what you're seeing. And, and if, I, if I can hopefully make this make sense, right? Um, I, th I think what you what you are speaking of, what I think of is uh, very Jocko Willink-ish. It's a dichotomy of truth. So you have mm -hmm. actual truth, actual truth. You've got perceived truth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they may actually be congruent, but more often than not, they are the complete inverse. Hence the dichotomy, the conflict, because they seem to be uh, completely different from one another. But the challenge is that regardless of which side you're on, it's real. Yes. And yeah. in a case of something significant, well something significant happening, and unfortunately it tends to be a bad thing, your ability to um, uh, cope, your ability to develop some type of normalcy, your ability to be able to move forward is um, predicated on uh, obtaining uh, an answer, a why. Mm. And I, I think we are all creatures of habit. And if we don't get information that we deem to be satisfactory, we will inevitably contrive what we believe to be. If that, I don't know if that was like a, like a real philosophical well, that makes thing, sense because you know. That makes perfect sense because I think at, at the core of this, of these issues, and uh, I believe Jason may have agreed with me and I'm sure you will agree with me. It is the, these biases that, that are ingrained in our society and that they, they are ingrained in, the, in a lot of people's uh, uh, minds and views and how they see things and, and these are heavily influenced by how you are brought up the people you were you grew up with the influences you had going into adulthood and then you have these pre preconceived biases or uh, understandings and that doesn't reflect to the actual truth of things and i think that when you have uh, uh, biases you can you can run into some problems and some issues and some misunderstandings that only lead to more problems and so on and so on. So I think our job is to, to, you know, to educate our youth better. Mm -hmm. And this has been said since the beginning of time, but it comes down to educating our youth better about, you know, society, how it functions and how, you know, what you see on TV all the time isn't necessarily fact. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, Communi there's always communication, but the question is, uh, was the message that was delivered the same as the message received? And if it's not, yeah. that's when we can run into some serious, serious problems, right? There's always communication. Yeah. Well, we're almost at a two-hour mark, Matt. I, we, I'm sure we can go on forever about all kinds of other stuff. Uh, thank you so much, man. Fantastic job. You did a great job you put in a lot of good points that you know same thing it was the same idea with jason last week where he brought up a lot of good things that set up light bulbs like oh i didn't think of that or oh i didn't think of this and you did the same thing this week bringing up a lot of good points from your point of view that i'm like oh i didn't think of that that's a good point and and there's definitely some uh, some hurdles and some challenges uh, from all parties 
but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, with the right people that we can find solutions and hopefully, uh, and again, ultimately it comes down to providing a better future for, for the youth. And I have kids and I want them to, you know, grow up in a, in a better world. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, buddy. I just want to throw in there a quick shout out to the Sucker Rubber shirt. I fucking love it. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to figure out what kind of shirt would be appropriate. And I was like, hey, you know what? That's kind of old school. Kind of, I think that that fits the bill pretty good. So, yeah, good, sp good spot. Good oh, man. Spot. Come on. It's like, I got to swear. Who doesn't, too, who doesn't like Sucker Rubber? Yeah. Who doesn't like Sucker Rubber? Everybody loves it. Well, maybe the Gracie family, but uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Michael. Great job. Matt, that was awesome, man. Really great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the kind words. It means a lot to me, my friend. And uh, hopefully true. one day you can come. And uh, hopefully one day we can get on the mat and you can kick my butt. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be quite the other way, man. With it, but the knowledge exchange, I, I would love that. I would love that opportunity. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.